I reviewed two of the articles. Let me find them real quick. Um, the Frontiers in Cell and Developmental Biology and another one on or no, no, diagnostic tools and diagnostic tools and prevention and uh, the optimal diagnostic methods for COVID-19. And this was for this week's topic on the emerging testing methods. Um, to start off, um, a big, a current, like a big problem right now in like the whole pandemic is having swift and uh, reliable um, testing methods to uh, like be available for like the majority of the population and that like aren't limited by resources as well as like time. Um, and two big categories that define testing methods are by the specificity and the sensitivity. Um, the sensitivity is basically how often a true positive will be produced. So like, let's say someone does have COVID, um, the, the chance that they will, that they actually do have it, and it's not a false positive. And the opposite of that would be the specificity. Um, that's the chance that a false negative would be produced for a result. Um, and that's uh, like when someone doesn't have it, that they, they truly don't have it. So I broke those down into a couple of relation notes into the merging methods for diagnoses and the current use uh, methods. And I'll start with the current use methods because there are three big sections right now. And that's biomarkers, uh, nucleic acid amplification techniques, and radiographic tests. Um, to start with the nucleic acid uh, amplification techniques. These methods are the most common because of RT-PCR, a uh, reverse transcriptase PCR, a reverse chain reaction. And that's, I think, the most uh, commonly used method. And that's used by turning a patient sample uh, and using um, reverse or RNA to reverse transcribe that sample and amplify it into cDNA multiple times over. And then that's tested. And I broke that down into advantage and disadvantages. Uh, and the sensitivity uh, and specificity are both pretty high for the RT-PCR, making it pretty beneficial. But the disadvantages are definitely that the cross, like there's cross contamination between the agents, and that can also be a problem as well as uh, um, the time it takes, because it's not immediate as a couple other methods that will be uh, shown later. Um, and these are a list of other nucleic acid uh, or NAAT techniques. So you have uh, this is an emerging method. Um, RT lamp is uh, similar to RT PCR. Uh, the difference is that there sh there shouldn't be thermocycling involved, where there is an RT PCR. Um, and yeah, that's basically NAAT techniques. Next up would be the biomarkers. Um, biomarkers are basically using antibodies and antigens uh, as like to uh, as, as a method rather than amplifying DNA or nucleic acids. And the three methods that I've laid out here are the ELISA techniques, SF, SBN, and LFIA, which is basically, this one is basically uh, literally a, a dipstick, which is covered with the chemical reagents as well as the antibodies. And, um, a single droplet is enough to test if a patient has COVID or if they don't. And again, so like that is completely different than um, uh, RT-PCR because one, it's using antibody and antigens. Uh, another thing is the time. So you have 15 minutes as opposed to multiple days and um, viral exposure and how much, and like their contact with other patients is also be uh, calculated. Um, so that's L and that's, or sorry, yeah, yeah, that's LFIA, and then oh, ELISA is basically uh, you basically have a well, and then on the bottom you have they're covered with antibodies that are specific to um, uh, the crony, the coronavirus ones, and they serve as ca capture antigens. So when a sample is placed in the wells, they're then uh, they bind to the epitopes, and then um, 
a secondary antibody used for recognition is uh, then coated on top. And then they're usually, they have a fluorescence marker or something on top of that. And they're finally measured by uh, using um, like photometry or something. Uh, and basically the, the quantity is measured by how much uh, fluorescence is uh, given off by the sample. Uh, another advantage is definitely the sensitivity. While not as high as RT-PCR, it's still uh, pretty high. And, but yeah, again, since it's not as high, you have a higher chance of false negatives and um, that'd be the disadvantages. And that's the rundown of biomarkers. And then um, the final mechanism would be radiographic tests. But the thing about radiographic tests is that they don't have, oops, they don't have a high uh, sensitivity nor uh, specificity. So instead they're used in conjunction with other techniques. Um, so they're like, uh, cause you can't primarily uh, deduce if a patient has coronavirus from just using CT scans or um, ultrasound or anything like that. Uh, CT scans and radiography both use uh, X-ray imagery and uh, they look at like lesions and other abnormalities within the patient's uh, pleural lining or lungs. And then on the other hand, you have an ultrasound. Uh, the ultrasound basically uses, a, a, well, sound, sound waves to um, try to get a structure of the patient's body. And again, like they don't have uh, a specificity or a sensitivity that nearly as high as uh, RT-PCR or uh, even the biomarker techniques. Um, and then the emerging methods uh, also got categorized under similar techniques like nucleic acid amplification or um, the biomarker techniques, but some that are um, a lot newer like CRISPR or the Cas13 uh, A assay, which is also like using the same protein that's used in CRISPR are both uh, new and um, they use, uh, they use again, Cas13 A and enzymes and uh, for recognition instead. And also, uh, this uses like the same like dipstick model, and they deserve uh, they they give results back within an hour, uh, which is a lot faster than current methods. Um, yeah, so testing methods are currently limited by resources, the time it takes, and specificity and specificity and sensitivity, uh, and finding like a technique that can serve all of them uh, are like have like that aren't like too expensive to produce in terms of chemical reagents or uh, like also being accurate at that is still being uh, is still difficult but some are being produced like uh, let's see where is it like RT lamp with that has shown a really high sensitivity and specificity um, and a couple other emerging techniques. Yeah. That's my quick presentation on emerging testing methods. Thanks, Sai. Um, before we move on to the next presenter, can you just introduce yourself again for the recording? Thanks. Okay, yeah. I'm, uh, my name is Sai, and uh, I'm a rising junior at UCSC, and uh, I'm an MC MCD bio major, which is a molecular, cellular, and developmental uh, biology. Great, thanks. Um, does anybody want to go next? If not, I can go. <laughs> so I can share my screen. Sorry, I'm just trying to find where I put the article for my study, it seems like. I 
it seems like something is not. Maybe I can refresh the page. I think there's been a change between the time I last worked on this and now, but I could just um, start with my introduction. So, hi, my name is Yeji. I go to Smith College. I'm a rising junior studying biochemistry and engineering. And today I'll be sharing my notes on uh, specifically on CT scans. And um, so, Yerim, who is a sophomore at Carnegie Mellon University, who uh, could not attend our meeting today, and uh, I read an article titled Diagnostic Testing for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Related Coronavirus 2 by Dr. Cheng and his colleagues. And it covered the basics of laboratory-based uh, molecular testing, such as RT-PCR. And it also shared some benefits and limitations of antigen detection tests and um, serologic tests that are being developed. And when we went on One Academy, we saw that Sai already had, uh, did a great job putting up a lot of information about these in more detail. So we added a bit more information about the current diagnostic tools by manufacturers and organizations that I believe are not mentioned in Sai's article. Um, so we included that information under the node detection methods used currently. And so if you go to detection meds, um, methods, used currently by manufacturers or actually organizations. I can start with that. Um, and if you go to the note on CDC, uh, in April, the CDC used two, primer, two PCR primer probe sets for N1 and N2 regions of viral nucle nucleocapsid gene and um, human and kinase P gene. And the World Health Organization, however, used test kits that um, targeted two areas, which are the envelope genes gene and the SARS-CoV-2 RDRP gene. And this RDRP enzyme just uh, catalyzes viral RNA replication from the RNA template. And so then we could go to currently um, FDA authorized for use in clinical labs, which should be here. Oh. Um, I believe I put it under here, but it's also missing now, so I'm not sure what's happening. Oh, actually, it's here. Sorry. <laughs> and um, so we just posted lists of FDA authorized test kits by manufacturers, and some um, include um, those used in clinical labs, and a few can be used outside. Um, clinical labs. And most of these tests use NAAT, which um, just as Sai described, it stands for nucleic acid amplification test, and um, it uses techniques like PCR. And this article briefly mentioned CT imaging um, tests to detect coronavirus patients, which is why I looked for and summarized a separate article that talks specifically about CT imaging detection, detection method for um, COVID-19 patients. So, um, let me just find the reference note for that to show you. Oh, yeah, here's. Um, sorry, I cannot find the reference note, but I know I made it, so. Um, but the article I read is called CT Imaging Features of COVID-2019 novel coronavirus by Dr. Chong and his colleagues. And um, so 
They state that CT imaging cannot be used as the only reliable diagnostic tool to detect infection due to its lack of sensitivity. However, um, it could be used in medical settings with limited resources where the virus is prevalent. So the researchers um, of this article based um, their study on 21 patients. Yeah, here we go. Um, 21 patients and um, interestingly two of the patients that they studied showed no obvious symptoms before CT scans and more than half were men and uh, the mean age of the patient, patients was 51. So after the first CT scans for the 21 patients, um, three showed normal chest CT examinations, and you could see that the presence of either ground glass opacities or consolidation was the highest among the patients. And you could also see that the number of lobes affected varies from uh, zero to five. And these numbers are probably influenced by the infection stage that, the, that each patient was in. And the uh, abnormalities were uh, predominantly found in the peripheral regions of patient lungs, and many showed rounded morphology. And lastly, uh, some showed crazy uh, paving pattern. And so I included images of the features that I just talked about right here. And so this is how the peripheral distribution looks like. And this is a crazy paving pattern, which um, is defined as thickened interlobular septa and intralobular lines with superimposed ground glass opacification. And this is just showing ground glass opacities with a rounded morphology in both upper lobes. So these arrows point to those rounded morphology. And so the eight patients, uh, including the ones who showed normal chest CT examinations initially, underwent a follow-up CT examinations. And the time between the initial CT and the follow-up CT was about 2.5 days on average. And they found that one infected patient, which is 13%, um, with normal initial scan showed no change. And another patient with normal initial scan showed a new solitary rounded um, peripheral ground glass lesion in CT image taken after three days. So this goes back to showing that CT scans by itself aren't reliable, but uh, may be used in clinical settings where um, they're lacking testing resources, that size, other testing resources that Sai has mentioned. And so in conclusion, they found that CT images of COVID-19 patients showed some similarities with um, the images of patients who suffered from the same viral family like SARS and MARS. And the common features include predominance in the peripheral regions, presence of crazy paving pattern, and the absence of pulmonary cavitations, pleural effusions, and lymphadenopathy. Sorry. And on the other hand, the chest CT images of COVID-19 patients that are different from other uh, coronaviruses showed no definite lobar or craniocaudal distribution and showed um, no discrete pulmonary emphysema or fibrosis. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. So does anybody else want to go? Um, I'll go. Thanks, Amanda. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> So um, my paper that I summarized was pretty short. It is um, more of a bioinformatics type paper. So it, it's not um, as immediately uh, related to vaccine development and vaccine uh, studies as the other papers that were presented. But this is a simulator for um, what was it? Uh, protein and ligand um, docking, which is very, very important to understanding um, the structure of COVID uh, or SARS-CoV-2, and that can help with vaccine development. That and surprisingly, there are not a lot of bioinformatics articles on vaccine development directly. So this was the closest thing I could find. Let me just share my screen. Give me a second.
Can anyone, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. So first off, um, basically understanding target ligand interactions is a really um, challenging problem that's that a lot of scientists and researchers are facing. Um, and it's really hard to observe the interactions in vitro. So to combat this, um, this docking server was developed and it's a web server that predicts the binding modes between COVID-19 targets and ligands and the um, the ones that were used in the simulation are small molecules, peptides, antibodies, etc. And um, a little bit of background on a lot of the proteins that have been discovered in SARS-CoV-2. So they've been discovered by researchers in China, including the main protease and spike protein that binds with um, ACE2, which is angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And that's the primary mode of entry that SARS-CoV-2 uses when initiating cell entry. So that was a really big discovery. Um, 181 structures have been released in the protein data bank and they are all related to 11 different kinds of SARS-CoV-2 proteins. However, um, a lot of the structures of the proteins remain unknown. So the modeled structures in this doc server are based on the, um, the homologous structures of SARS-CoV um, because they have a high amino acid identity between the two, which is like 77.2%. Okay, so the doc server web interface is written in HTML and PHP, and JSM mole is used for the molecular visualization. And in this, um, 27 targets in viral reproduction, they've been chosen or they're available for docking simulation. And these are all the proteins, all 27. I've counted them myself. <laughs> And then here um, we go through the types of the main types of docking that the server simulates. So there's small molecule docking, experimental complex structure docking, um, homology modeled structure docking, and antibody and peptide docking. So I'll go through each of them first. So for small molecule docking, Autodoc Vena is used as a docking engine, and then Open Babel was used for format transformation or 3D coordinate generation. So this is mainly um, a bunch of spatial-esque software. So figure A is an example of small molecule docking. Let me try to zoom in here. I can do that, okay. So it's gonna be a little blurry, sorry about that. Um, the RDRP, which is the um, give me a second. <coughs> so RDRP is um, RNA dependent RNA polymerase, and it's shown to dock. It's shown to have docked with its inhibitor, and the structure of RDRP with its inhibitor is colored in gray, and then the predicted structure of top one is colored in pink. So that just gives you an idea of how this um, uses existing information on SARS-CoV to predict how um, new target ligand interactions will look in SARS-CoV-2. And then the next one is experimental complex structure docking. So for this, the docking box was set on the center of the ligand and um, 30A by 30A by 30A, that's just the length that was used to include uh, the residues of the entire cavity. And then in figure B, the image shows an example of small molecule batch docking, so multi lots of small molecules. And the crystal structure of the main protease is colored in gray, and the predicted binding poses of 11 inhibitors are shown in different colors. So this all shows the different colors here. And then for, um, this one, uh, for homology modeled structures, it is defined according to the active sites or binding sites of its homologs in SARS-CoV. So figure C shows an example of peptide docking and the post-fusion state of the S2 segment of the spike protein is docked with the helical peps uh, peptide. And the six uh, helices structure of S2 is colored in gray here. And then the predicted structure of top one is colored in pink. 
And then lastly, antibody and peptide docking. So for um, peptide and antibody structures, CODOC PP is used as a docking machine, and it provides a multi-stage FFT-based strategy for both global docking and site-specific docking, which is why it was used. An angle interval of 15 degrees is used for rotational sampling, and a spacing of 1.2a is adopted for the FFT transla translational search. The top two, the top binding note modes are clustered with ligand root mean square deviations, and it's a cutoff of 3.0a in global docking and 2.0a in site specific docking. And figure D shows an example of antibody docking. Uh, the spike protein docked with the antibody, and it's the spike protein is colored in gray, and the predictive structure is colored in pink. The predictive structure of top one, which is the target ligand sort of interaction. And that concludes my presentation. It was a short and sweet paper. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thanks, Amanda. Does anybody else want to present? Um, I can just briefly go through my topic. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one second. OK, so I'm sharing screen. Um, so my paper focused on um, nasopharyngeal swabs, like different from nasal swabs or the nasal watch or a nasal caretage. It's supposed to be less invasive. And the study focused on multiple testing with this method. So they said that specifically for children, it's difficult to collect uh, multiple biological samples. So to study the effectiveness of multiple testing with the single MP swab, um, they tested, they tried testing um, one swab um, for bacterial culture, viral detection through PCR, cytokine measurement, um, RNA sequencing, and 16S ribosomal RNA gene, gene sequencing. Um, and children with diagnosed acute sinusitis, so who they know had um, sinusitis. And um, the method is just that they use the swab, um, they inserted it in the nose, and then um, they refrigerated it. And I just went over like the statistical method and um, her um, type of testing. So we have bacterial viral detection, like I said, um, cytokine measurement, and then the two RNA ones. And they actually had this figure um, so you can see first they obtain the swab and then they cut off um, the end of the swab and they actually said that that um, here I noted it that it did not affect um, the richness of the microbiome on the swab um, so I thought that was interesting and what else and then they also said that um, they could use mid turbinate sampling as an alternative to the mp swab so as an even more um, or as an even less invasive measure um, they can use it as an alternative to mp swabs and it's similarly sensitive to most viral and bacterial pathogens so some other methods that were also non-invasive were not as um, sensitive to detecting the virus or the bacteria um, but the mid-terminate sampling was, so they could also use this for multiple testing in the future. And I just, I wasn't exactly sure how to connect it to COVID-19. Um, the paper was from 2019, but it was like on our list. And I just thought it was interesting that they focused on children because like obtaining multiple samples, like I said, might be especially difficult for this population. So seeing how this can be applied to children, um, perhaps for COVID-19 testing, I think will be interesting in the future. So that's all I have. Thanks, Samantha. Um, does anybody else want to go? If not, that's also fine. And then we could end our recording here and then discuss how we'll be moving forward next week. Okay, I'll stop the recording. Thanks, guys.